Thank you for coming here to this 10th conference, the 10th International ASPO conference. And uh, it says 10 years of ASPO, lesson learned. And my lesson I have summed up in this book, Peaking at Peak Oil. And uh, in uh, this book uh, you get the story of ASPO, but you also got some scientific fact where we stand and how the future might be. And uh, it started, it started, I can say, in 1998 when Colin Campbell and Jean Leray published their very famous article in Scientific American. Uh, you should notice that they say it's the global production of conventional oil will begin to decline sooner than most people think, uh, possibly within 10 years. And what they said at this time in 1998 was that we should have a peak in the conventional oil production at 72 million barrels in 2006. So let's see what is the reality. You see here to the left, that is uh, from the uh, International Energy Agency, and they said that the peak of the conventional oil was in 2006, but it was not 72 million barrels per day, it was only 70 million barrels per day. So. Uh, I think it's fantastic that we should know that they were right at that time because so many people have said they were wrong, but they were exactly right. And I think that it's uh, very sad that uh, Jean and Colin cannot be here today because of personal things, but uh, we should all give them a big hand for what they have done to put this forward because without their work we had not been where we are today. So for Colin and Jean. <clears throat> If you now look at the forecast that International Energy Agency says about conventional oil, they have, it's a declining, and the, the existing uh, fact is that the oil fields in production is declining with something like 4 million barrels per year. And we have looked into this into scientific papers that is possible to, to read. It's also interesting to see what they have said about the future production during the time that ASPA has been working. Uh, in 2004, they said the oil production in 2030 should be 121 million barrels per day, and we said, no, no, no. And then the chain, they said, well, maybe not that, but 160 million barrels per day, and ASPO said, no, no, no. And they said, change their mind again, and they say 106, and we said, no, and 96, and we still say no. So this year, it might be 86, uh, it's a forecast for me, what the International Energy Asia will say, but uh, we don't know, but it will be a lower number, I'm sure of that. And uh, what they're saying here is that the red uh, sector here, that is the oil that should be produced in fields that has not yet been found. And that is 18 million barrels per day. And if we, if we should compare with something, we should compare with the North Sea, because the North Sea had a maximum production of 6 million barrels per day. So what they're saying officially is that they believe we should find three regions of the size of the North Sea and put in production and have them in maximum production in, in 2030. And who believes in this one. I don't believe in it, and I don't think, I hope no one in this room believes this can be true. So this means we are really facing a problem when it comes to conventional oil. So the question we asked in 2000 when we were thinking about ASPO is, uh, why have the oil companies swept uh, the discussion of the Hubbard model under the rug? Because at that time we talked about the Hubbard model, and the Hubbard peak, and the oil peak. <clears throat> and uh, in 2001, and by the way, in December 2000, and, uh, 2000 uh, I had a telephone conversation with Colin Campbell and he said he thinks he should start an organization and he liked to call it uh, the Association for the Study of the Oil Peak, but I said it, that should be uh, ASOP and I thought that, that didn't sound too good. So when Colin said, well, we may change, we may change the wording and instead we are saying uh, the Association for the Study of the Peak Oil and that was the time when peak oil was first mentioned. 
And the first time the peak oil was mentioned in the international press was in 2002, when they had our first conference in Uppsala in Sweden. And that was Bruce Stanley from Associated Press. He wrote an article that came out in 20, uh, I think 26 different countries. And in this article, he was mentioned the word peak oil for the first time in international press. Today, if you make a Google search, you get 7 million. So we have really spread the world around, the word around the world. <clears throat> So we have also then defined what we think uh, uh, we mean with peak oil. And as peak oil is the word for ASPO, it's ASPO's word. We also think that we can define what the peak oil is. And Colin Campbell said that the term peak oil refers to the maximum rate of production of oil in any area under consideration, recognizing that it's a final natural resource subject to depletion. And this word depletion is very important. I will come back to that. Today, we have ASPO organizations around the world. You see the countries here, and you see the dots. And here are some of the logotypes from the different uh, national ASPO organizations. And of course, we can do more, and we need to discuss how to do more. But I'm very proud to see that all around the world, people are discussing peak oil issues just now. <clears throat> and this is the number of conferences, and we are up to number 10. And you see, it's a very nice row of conferences. And I must say I've been to all of them, and uh, I think it's been great conferences. And at this time, I'd like to thank all the local organizers of the conference in the past and here, because they have made a fantastic good work. At the first conference in Uppsala, we made a press release, <coughs> and we said that the world oil depletion curve uh, above is uh, based on all available information on uh, oil reserves and estimates of the amount of yet to be farmed and so on. And we said there will be a plateau production 2009, 2010, 2011, and the production volume will be 85 million barrels per day. The reality is that uh, if you look into oil and all the categories, we can see that what's one category that we didn't uh, count on that time, and that was uh, shale oil, and I will mention a little bit about that also. But it's also important to know what, when they talk about oil, what is the really meaning? So for instance, when International Energy Agency are saying oil, they are talking about uh, ethanol is called oil, processing gains are true, uh, called oil, and all these things. But if you look into reality, we have now a plateau of the production. And if you take the BP data that is very easy to follow, you can see that in 2007 we have had a thesis in Uppsala that has a different scenarios for future production, and we can see that it's the low scenario that we now are following. So all the high one we had to take out from the future. And that means that the barrel, the level we put at 85 million barrels per day the industry couldn't reach it. So they have stopped at 82, and this is illustrated by the high jumper that is not passing the 85 million barrels bar. And uh, <clears throat> depletion, yes, that is something that my research group at Uppsala University have been studying, and we could study especially re depletion of remaining resources. And this is a very important number, because this is what will guide the future in the production. And if you take, for instance, the Prudhoe Bay uh, oil field, you see at the end, when the plateau end, you see that the maximal fraction of oil that it was possible to uh, extract from the field, and you see it's in a percentage. And then you have it to the left from all the fields uh, we have been studying. And if you take a region like the North Sea, <coughs> we see that we have a plateau about 6%. And that means that every year it's not possible to extract more than 6% of the oil that you have on the ground. And this depletion number is why we see a decline in the production, even though the reserves and resources might be high. But, but that has to do with physics, because we are in a, th in, a, in, a, in a way that physics takes over the economic roles. And of course, the most important things are the giant oil fields. And if we now look at all the oil fields that have been discovered and they have been found and presented data for, you can divide the green curve at the top of the number of fields found and how big the fields are. So if you look at the red curve, that is the number of fields, and you see the number of fields peaked in the 80s. At that time, they discovered 360 fields per year. So that was one field per day was the discovery rate. But you can see the decline in the size of the fields is a logarithmic scale, so it's a bit smaller and smaller, but technology made it possible to still to find the small fields. So if we look into the future here now, 
uh, I don't expect that we should find more than 260 oil fields per year in the future. I mean, uh, 260 oil fields per year, I, I don't think that is a pessimistic number, but the size of the field will still be small, and that means if we add up everything, you have the green curve, what oil have we found, and what we can find in the future when it comes to conventional oil, and that number is less than 200 billion barrels. That is the maximum we can expect to find in the future. So we are pumping now what we have found, and we are pumping it and we're consuming it. But when we pump it, we have to think about the laws of physics, you know. And the law that is guiding us is the racist flow law. And that means that Q is the, the, the number of the, the amount of oil coming out of the ground. And then you see the, the thickness of the oil, the porosity of the, the, the reservoir, and the area that you have the, the drilling things. And of course, horizontal, horizontal drilling uh, made the A bigger, but the other parameters are still the same. So that means we are in a situation that the laws of physics are guiding us into the future. It's not the law of economies that many people believe. And of course, the technology makes it possible to go deeper and deeper down. And if you look now, for instance, on the Gulf of Mexico production, you see that the plateau in the production around uh, 0.8 million barrels per day, even if they go deep. And of course, during this uh, things it's very hard. If you look, for instance, at the Jack 2 that was very much in the press uh, some years back, you see they took the platform all out to 2,100 meters, and that is the height of the highest mountain in Sweden, Kebenekaise. And then they were drilling down to 8,000, uh, more than 8,000 meters, and that is the highest of Mount Everest, the highest mountain in, in, in the world. So they are down in these regions and finding something. And at the end now, they said in the beginning it should be 10 billion barrels, but now we know it's you not even 500 million barrels in this field. So, of course, this very technical, complicated things means that you can also have problems, and this is, of course, what we know about the deep water horizon, what's happened. So, the reserve numbers that is discussed is also something that we must learn. I will just mention that some are talking about proven reserves, the 1P, and some are talking about proven and probable, the 2P, and some are even talking about prob probable, proven, and possible reserves. And all these things is what you need to learn and to understand when you should discuss and look into the future. Another important factor is how much oil can you get out from the field down there. And this is the recovery factors of thousands and thousands of fields around the world. And the, uh, the, the blue curve is the, the global average around uh, 29%. And the industry thinks that it might be possible to come up to 39%. And that will, of course, make the slope less steep compared to what it is, uh, otherwise should be. But it will not dramatically increase the production. Another thing we must know is that even if we have the same tank, it's the same convention, we take conventional oil and unconventional oil, that the tap is different. You have a much larger tap when you have the conventional oil compared to the unconventional. And an example, like take a, to a look at the, uh, tar, uh, the uh, can Canadian tar sand production. Number 10 there, that is an oil refinery. If you have the conventional oil, you can put the oil directly in the refinery. But if you use the tar from the tar sand, you must go through an industry. And of course, that costs money and it's not so possible to do it as fast as uh, you should th like to have it. And it has environmental effects. And the, the native people living up there now has very prob big problems with their health because of the production from the oil sand. And I have summed up what might be possible to get from unconventional oil production in the future. And you see, during the next 25 years, I think that it might be possible to increase it with 9 million barrels per day. But then you should know that every year there is a decline of 4 million barrels per day in the conventional oil production. So again, this is very hard to get something to be not being a peak oil. And this is what we are saying from Uppsala, that we have some, still some scenarios. We have called the fast, the slow case. And we, if we take the fast one, it might be possible to come up with to 84, and are talking about the way BP is looking into oil production. And uh, we have to see where we will end up. All of this is possible to read in published papers. The important thing for us to understand when it comes to politicians is that the, the world is divided into two categories of countries. Countries that are exporting oil and countries that are importing oil. And you see all that the tankers that is leaving the Middle East every day. It's nine super tankers that every day is leaving the Middle East. Three go to Europe and United States and six to India and Asia. So the world 
if we look into the production and consumption, we heard that India and China is increasing their consumption dramatically. And that means if we look into the, the reality now, and we have had a plateau production since 2005 to 2010-11, you see that the, from 1999 to 2005, there was an increase in the export volume of about 6 million barrels per day. But if you see the green factor, that is what the oil-producing countries themselves are using, is declining. So in five years, the import volume declined with 4 million barrels. But for us in the OECD countries, we got even a harder problem because China and India and those countries increased their import with 3. So in five years, OECD countries lost 15% of available oil to use. And according to my opinion, that is why we have an economic crisis in Europe just now. And if you look into the future, even if you say we have a pl plateau production into the future, we see that the oil producing countries, they will consume more oil, and the China and India will consume more. So we will be squeezed. And from compared to when they had the maximum available oil for import in 2005 to 2020, we will lose 50% available oil to import for Europe. And this is something that politicians must understand and uh, do something again. What has been discussed during this 10 years is the climate. And uh, of course uh, it says that it's going to get warmer. And uh, it says that we should close using fossil fuel because of the climate. But the thing is that we maybe need to close using it because of other facts instead. This is what IPCC is saying when it comes to possible increase in the temperature in the future, and you're all very much familiar with this one. If you now look at the peak oil, we have the peak in the discovery, and we know that there is a peak in production, and we can do some estimation about what will the possibility for production be in the future. And then, <clears throat> as we then compare what IPCC has put forward and said, this is the possible scenarios for the production of oil into 2100, and this was released in year 2000 by EASA that was responsible for this. And I would say that, no, it, this was not possible. These scenarios that they have been used for calculating the emissions from, from oil is wrong. The, you cannot use so much oil, and that has to do with the fact of the depletion. This uh, high level production in 2100, you never have that oil at all available. It's not possible at all. And of course we have, uh, if you sum up what the, they are saying is possible to use and look into the reality, we see it's only three of the, 37, three of the 40 scenarios that has, uh, is within the range here. We also know that there's a peak in the discovery of natural gas, and we can do some estimation about the future. And if we add what oil and gas need and can be produced, you see that all the 40 scenarios are missing the targets. It's not possible to get up to those numbers at all. But people have said that we have coal. So my research group at Uppsala University, especially Michael Höck that's sitting here, has looked into the possible production of coal in the future. And it's quite easy because there's only six countries we're talking about. And there is a peak in the coal production around 2030. And if you now put that into IPCC's scenarios about future production when it comes to emission of carbon dioxide, you see they're missing it completely. And uh, again, if we add up everything, we see the maximum use of the fossil fuel available and so on will not reach the lower level of the, what is done. In the, so I can say that for 10 years, climate scientists have completely wrong data to do the calculations for. So they have been misled by this, uh, would I say, uh, very bad report. And uh, this means that the target in the future, no, there's not the six degrees increase when it just comes to, if you look into emissions, there are other things that might be important. So what we should discuss in the future is what should we do with the, uh, with the carbon dioxide drug loads. I mean, these are the countries that can emit carbon dioxide in the future. If we have 15 countries here and they have the resources to emit 80% of the total carbon dioxide in the future. So we should discuss with these countries how should they, we get a plan for them not to produce so much fossil fuel. That is what we should do. We should not have 190 countries running around the world and have fun. The reality, if I sum up, is that we are at the point now when it comes to global use of oil, and the economists are saying we need more energy for the future to get the economy running. The environmental people, the green curves, are saying that we should cut the production of fossil fuel with 50% or 100% to 2050. 
But then they have the blue curve, a very important thing. That is the amount of fossil fuel needed to supply the world with food. I mean, we should all eat. 30% of all the fossil fuel used today is used to get food on the table. And they are not discussing what we should have instead if we should not use fossil fuel. And, <coughs> excuse me, and down there you have uh, the <coughs> yellow curve, and that is where the renewable energy is today, including hydro and everything. And what I've just shown here is a 7% increase per year that is the maximum we can see as a possibility in the future. And you see these curves must come together. And all of this is, of course, very hard to find a solution, but we must find a solution. So time is running out. Time is running out. No question about it. And the time is running out for all of us here, and we must do something. And uh, what we have done in my uh, research group, have been, we have uh, been working hard on it. And, and I have summarized all this in this book here, Peaking at Peak Oil. And my good friend, Ole Kvennestad, that is here today also, he has made the illustrations to the book. The, it's 110 illustrations in the book now. And uh, my English is not that good, so I cannot write a book in English. So I'm very happy because I have Michael Lardell in, in Adelaide in Australia that knew Swedish. So I've been writ uh, written the things in Swedish and he has translated as a scientist into English. So the English is very good in it. I can just guarantee that. But, uh, but I, I'm, I must say that without my students at Uppsala University, you see the first group I had when I started in 2003, it was Colin, I, and uh, Frederick, and, uh, and Anders, and then it's, it's been more and more students here. And now Uppsala University has decided to, when I retire, to open up a completely new position for a professor that should be working with the things, I would say that Uppsala University will very soon as announce the first peak oil professorships that it will be available to apply for. So again, peaking at peak oil. Thank you.